When you talk about the trailblazer of the year 2022, clearly one name stands out, and that's got to be Mahindra and Mahindra. I'm going to be in conversation with Rajesh Ajurikar and talk about what the year ahead and, of course, the year gone by looked like. Rajesh, good morning. Hi, what a morning. fabulous year it's been. Highest ever bookings, highest ever waiting period, mega launches. How does it feel? It feels good and, uh, you know, it's not often that you get years like this and yeah. 2020 is clearly one of those years which has been spectacular in all our businesses. Uh, the SUV business, of course, like you said, has had very good launches, very good momentum. Uh, we've got to the top of the table on SUV revenue market share, so that feels good. Yeah. We've also had a very successful electric uh, three-wheeler journey yes. and that's done very well. We are at 70% market share, seeing a lot of growth there. Uh, the tractor business has done very well. We gained 0.9% market share. So, you know, all in all, we feel good about a year which is just just passing us as we are at the end of 2022. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All is well, but I want to talk about, you know, what happens next. You've had extremely successful launches, like you said. You know, the new and improved Thar, the Scorpio N. You've had Mahindra, um, you know, XUV 700 and, of course, the EV launch. What next in the pipeline? Well, right now, firstly, the most exciting thing for us is the XUV 400, which yes. is our first electric uh, passenger launch in a long time. Uh, that's going to start with test drives in January, and then we start deliveries across Feb and March. So that is exciting, and we've got a lot of very good positive feedback on that. We will announce the prices sometime in the middle, you know, early middle of Jan. Uh, I'm sure it'll be competitively priced, knowing you all. Yeah, and uh, it should uh, it should turn out to be a good launch as well. So that's right now what's immediately on the end. We'll be doing a few interesting things on Thar, which we'll talk about in early Jan. Mm -hmm. uh, we feel the opportunity to grow the category uh, is there still. We, of course, we've literally created this category because, you know, when we launched this a couple of years back, nobody thought that anyone is going to buy a two-door. Yeah. Uh, and you know we've really created the two-door category in India and there's there's opportunity to do more so we're going to do stuff with Thar as well uh, so and of course we have all these launches which are so recent so we've got to consolidate on them a key priority for us now is to start bringing down the waiting period you know and the time to say okay so much is the waiting period and feel good about it is I, I don't think that's <laughs> yeah. that doesn't make anyone feel good neither us nor customers so our priority now is to say waiting period is down we are able to deliver a lot and get uh, get the vehicles across to customers but rajesh tell me the best ever year that the industry has had in the many recent past um the automotive segment is still clocking just single digit margins why is that because historically you've had better well the two Two things you got to think uh, of when you think of automotive margins. One is around the world, automotive margins are in single digits and much lower than what we have in India. So actually, our margins are very comparable to the best in the world. Even in India, the Mahindra margins are better than the peers which are announced. Uh, that's the publicly listed companies. Uh, to your specific question on why, what are the historical margins and how do we compare? Uh, margin as a percentage is always a function of what's happening to the denominator as well, right? Because what so today what happens is when you see a very high inflation in the economy, you're not passing on the margin on the margin, right? So when you don't pass on the margin on the margin and you pass on only the absolute cost, the percentage comes down because, you know, your denominator is inflated to the uh, sure. price increase, effect, but you've yes. not added, you've not added the uh, margin on the this thing. So while your unit margin is protected, your percentage margin is going to come down. And that's what's happening everywhere in the economy. So in an inflationary economy, the margins always uh, get, um, capped. Get, get capped at a certain mm. level or they don't move at the same pace. Mm. Uh, so if you look back, you know, the last two years, we've had inflation of about 18 percent. But we also had the BS6 transition. Uh, so when you look at all the change events, it's the BS6 transition and in commodity inflation. So in such a situation, we are able to get a double-digit EBITDA in auto, which is we think is a very good uh, performance. We've improved our margin quite substantially over the last year as you know new products have stabilized, the operating leverage has kicked in, and through multiple cost reduction initiatives. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to get this better and I don't want to get this wrong. Are you saying that margins could be capped at, uh, let's just watch out for the step, uh, could be capped at high single digits? 
in the very near term? Yeah, we don't normally give a guidance, but sure. you know, we are in the, we've shown a sequential improvement in our auto margins. Mm. And uh, we have said that there is headroom uh, because operating leverage, uh, new products getting off the waiting, uh, the initial booking amount, uh, you know, the booking, uh, what should, how should I put it? The new products had a certain price protection for a given point of time for 25,000, 50,000. So as those products get off that, they move into uh, current prevalent pricing. So with all of those initiatives and cost reduction, we are seeing a headroom for margin upwards. So what happens to the competitive landscape, Rajesh? Is it a point of nervousness or is it more like a challenge and that there's room for all? Because I remember watching the FIFA World Cup final and there were three uh, listed auto players who were out there marketing and, you know, show showcasing all their ads. There was you, there was Maruti and there was Tata Motors. And now everyone wants to get into SUVs. Wherever you look, there are only uh, urban SUVs everywhere. You know, co competition is always very healthy. It huh. always gets the best out of everyone. Mm. Uh, we really believe that we have to be consumer focused. That's our, the way we think about building our brands, creating product portfolio, which will at any point of time continue to wow customers. Uh, does it make us nervous? Yeah, it does and it should. <laughs> yeah. uh, because then you are better prepared, right? Uh, so, coming to the competitive intensity and the size of the SUV market today, SUVs is 50% and we had, you know, this conversation yeah. in an earlier chat, uh, which, is, which is fairly large. So, you know, the category is growing as well. So, to be number one in revenue market share in a segment which is 50% of the total passenger vehicle market, by volume and probably much larger by value because uh, you know the SUVs are typically priced higher is a good place to be in. So it's good if competition comes in and helps grow the category together. So we don't we don't think that's bad. It's good, and uh, we, it always will keep us uh, focused on, on upping up our game. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Tell me more about XUV 400. Uh, you know that that's going to be an exciting offering from your stable. Yeah. So that's. Uh, you know, what we've done interestingly is, so firstly by way of the industry size there. So there's a B segment electric SUV and a C segment electric. The B segment penetration has just one primary player and that's a re, you know, the penetration in the region of 2-3%. The C segment SUV electric has literally no competition and a penetration of uh, less than 1%. So the Which is the higher end? Yeah, which is uh, the higher end. The, the C segment, in a way, size-wise, goes a little above four meters. Uh, so really, it's an unpenetrated market, and the task really is to create the market. Our product, uh, the 400, is actually 4.2 meters. So it goes, it is, from a size point of view, a C, C segment SUV. Uh, but it will compete with B and try and get, uh, you know, B segment buyers to have more comfortable, spacious. Uh, this is the fastest uh, electric SUV as well, so that's true to our brand DNA. Mm. Uh, it's 0 to 100 is I think in and 0. 3 segments, yeah. Mm. Uh, so spacious, uh, brand, uh, the brand DNA of speed, acceleration, power, some very interesting features like a single pedal uh, to make, you know, driving a city comfortable. So I think we have a very good offering and uh, we hope it will be a good launch as we get into 2023. Tell me, when we last spoke in August at your Kandivali factory, you were talking about as to how semiconductor chips continue to be a shortage and that's one very big reason that, you know, the waiting period along with, of course, your capacities uh, is that high. Are all supply side issues tackled with, and yes, commodity prices, they've been just so hugely volatile. Are all those bottlenecks anywhere getting close to resolved? You know, we had a significant disruption as we spoke about mm. a year, year and a half back. So that's behind us because that was one specific supplier where we had an issue. Mm. Uh, the semiconductor situation as an industry is still tight and it will be through most of 2023. It's something that is going to be volatile, it's something that has to be managed very closely uh, and we're doing that. Uh, the China situation is always going to create um, disruption as we're seeing right now. Yeah. They don't have the lockdowns, but seemingly what's happening right now is going to be worse than lockdowns because uh, as we've seen in India a year, year and a half back and many other parts of the world, um, you know, people are not able to get to work right now because of what's going on. So that's, that's a story which still has to play out. We, it's very hard to anticipate at the moment what's going on. 
uh, and how much it will impact us. So I guess, you know, uh, if anyone thought that supply chain is just one part of an organization which <laughs> can chug along on its own, well, uh, no, the last two years has, yeah, last two years yeah. has taught us that it's not and yeah. it's very much up and center stage in, and will be, I think, for a period of time. So it's something that we just have to track and manage well as we go along. So how is it that, Rajesh, you try and narrow down or at least uh, bring down the waiting period? Because the other day I was talking to someone and they said they've been waiting for their Scorpio for eight months. <laughs> Scorpio, they can't be waiting for eight months because we started bookings much later. So, But they're probably, it, Scorpio N has a long yes. waiting period. So uh, I think to the question of how do we mitigate risk, what we are doing is uh, creating alternate chip uh, suppliers uh, because very often what or what we've done in the past is really rely on uh, firstly mainly on tier one and let them manage the chip situation because it was never an issue. Uh, today we have you know de-aggregated it, understood tier two, tier three. Uh, related to semiconductors and to the extent possible we are creating alternate sources of chips uh, so that we are not completely dependent on one disruption. Uh, but you know like we've spoken about earlier we have like uh, over 200 chips in a product like XUV700. Uh, any of them can get disrupted from any of the sources right and then you you are basically have a supply side disruption. So. Uh, the more, the higher end the product, the more complex is the supply chain and greater chance of disruption. And hence we have to have stronger mitigation plans by way of de-risking. What about market share? Um, I see a lot and a lot more of the Mahindra cars on the Indian roads. What's it looking like and where do you think you're going to head in the next, say, one to two years? You know, directionally we are saying that we would like to see, be number one in the SUV market share space uh, by way of revenue. Uh, there will be months when we may be number one on volume, but I don't think we can be over obsessed with that given uh, the kind of portfolio where we have, where our average selling price is really twice that of the industry. Uh, so we think revenue market share is a, is a good representation of how we're playing in the industry and that's where we would like to be number one. Uh, at this moment, we are very close by on number one by way of volume as well. We had two months where we were number one on volume, volume market share. So we'd hope to stay that way. Like you said, it's, it is a competitive space. It's 50% of the industry. Everyone wants to be here. And uh, we will be keeping on doing things to up our game. And electric uh, SUV is a key part of that.